Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. We're pleased to welcome uh, New York Times best-selling novelist Sheldon Siegel to uh, visit us as part of the Authors at Google program, and he's here to speak about his latest book, Judgment Day. Uh, Sheldon is a graduate of the UC, uh, UC Berkeley's uh, Bolt School of Law, and he has been a practicing attorney in San Francisco for the last 25 years. Uh, Judgment Day is the sixth novel in his series of uh, critically acclaimed best-selling courtroom dramas. For fans of Sheldon's work, I'd also recommend uh, checking out his personal website, SheldonSiegel.com. Uh, I googled you before you got here, I have to admit that. Um, you can find a good deal of interesting information and Sheldon provides some very thoughtful answers to questions if you're interested. Uh, we'll have time for uh, questions, as always, towards the end of the talk. So as a quick reminder, if you could use the uh, microphone we have set up so that people on YouTube can hear the, uh, the questions, that'd be really appreciated. So with that, let's welcome Sheldon Siegel to Google today. Thank you. Thank you for that nice uh, introduction. Can you all hear me pretty well? Uh, thank you for inviting me down to Google. This is just great. Um, it's, uh, it's the center of the universe now, in, in my mind. And I'm, I'm just so impressed by uh, both the, the setup here and also what you guys do day to day. Uh, I think uh, Google is kind of living proof that if you take a lot of very talented people and give them an opportunity to be creative and expand their horizons, you can do just spectacular things. So uh, it is really nice to be down here. And uh, thank you for the warm welcome and for the nice lunch. And um, I really appreciate the fact that you all came out today. Um, I, um, I live up in Marin County, and I work in San Francisco. A uh, little bit about me. Uh, I. Um, I am a corporate and securities lawyer in the daytime with a big firm, cozy little place called Shepard, Mullen, Richter, and Hampton. It's a firm of about 500 lawyers that's based here in California. And our San Francisco office has about, uh, about 100 lawyers. Um, I live in Marin where I'm known as Linda's husband and Alan and Stephen's dad. Uh, Linda uh, was a, is a computer graphic artist who worked at Lucasfilm for about 20 years and she recently moved to a new company called Image Movers Digital up in Marin and uh, she has the cool job in the family. Uh, our twin sons, uh, Alan and Steven, just turned 16 and uh, in addition to being sophomores in high school, they just learned how to drive. So if you happen to be on the roads of southern Marin for the next, say, couple of years, be very, very careful. Uh, it's, uh, a little, it's a little scary out there. Um, I am 49 years old. I will be 50 in a few months. Um, and I'm a very unlikely author, I guess you could say. Um, my background uh, is really not typical for someone who writes novels. Uh, I grew up in Chicago. I got an accounting degree from the University of Illinois in Champaign. Uh, I went to law school in Berkeley. Uh, it's nice to see some Cal people here today. Um, and since uh, I graduated from law school in 1983, uh, I uh, have been in, in private practice in San Francisco doing corporate and securities work for big law firms. Um, there's no English major. There's no 20 novels in the bottom drawer of my desk. Um, and there's absolutely nothing in my resume that would suggest that I should be writing novels, other than the fact that it's something I've always wanted to do. And I think if you talk to most writers, and I know you get a lot of writers coming into Google here, which I think is just wonderful, I think if you talk to most writers that they would, um, they would tell you that uh, there's something in our system, something in our wiring that says we have to do this. And there's no reason particularly why other than we, we kind of need to write. Um, and I knew even when I was back in high school, and certainly by the time I was in college, even though I was studying things that were very practical, that I was hopefully going to, um, I was hopefully going to be able to write a novel someday. Um, I appreciate the fact, those of you who have actually read my books or bought my books, uh, Judgment Day, which I'll talk about in a minute, is the sixth in the series of books set in San Francisco. Uh, they've all been New York Times bestsellers. They have all uh, done very well. The critics have been very nice to me. Um, so I thank you uh, uh, for buying the books, because I also no longer have to practice law full time anymore, which is, uh, which is nice. Uh, Judgment Day is the sixth, and I have a deal for two more books. So the seventh and the eighth will be out in the next couple of years. Um, 
the stories which are set in San Francisco are uh, about a lawyer named Mike Daly and his law partner and ex-wife, Rosie Fernandez. Mike is a guy from the Sunset District in San Francisco. Uh, he's a, uh, a very good criminal defense lawyer. He's also a former public defender, a former priest, a former partner to big law firm, and a former husband. Um, that gives him pretty much uh, plenty, of, uh, plenty of background and, uh, for a few more stories, at least I hope. Uh, he practices law on the uh, south side of uh, Mission Street with his ex-wife, Rosie Fernandez, who grew up in the Mission. Um, Mike and Rosie met at the Public Defender's Office, and they, um, they were better at being lawyers than they were at being married. And there's a certain amount of tension between the two of them that goes through these books. Um, so I hope you'll like that part of it. If you're looking for um, plot-driven John Grisham thrill rides, that's not what I'm trying to do. Uh, my stuff is character-driven, uh, it's San Francisco-centric, and I try to make both San Francisco and my characters come alive, because I think the most interesting stories are the ones about the characters and not so much about the roller coaster ride. And I can tell you the plots to my books um, in about a sentence and a half. Uh, my first was a book called Special Circumstances. It came out in 2000, and that was a story about a murder in a big law firm. My second book was called Incriminating Evidence, and that was a story about a prominent politician getting into trouble when he is uh, found in a room with a dead prostitute. Um, third book was called Criminal Intent. That was a story about a prominent Bay Area movie producer who uh, uh, winds up dead on Baker Beach, uh, having been bludgeoned by perhaps his, uh, his young movie starlet wife. Um, as you can tell, I can recite the plot lines in these books pretty quickly because I don't view my stories as being driven by the plot, although you do have to have one, and it helps if you can come up with something reasonably original. Um, the new book, Judgment Day, uh, is a story about a death penalty case. Um, and the premise of that book was simple. The, the oldest man on death row is about to be executed. He's also about to die of natural causes. And the question is, can Mike and Rosie stop the execution within 10 days? How's that for a ticking clock? Um, trying to build up suspense. The story behind that book and where the whole idea came from actually started with my daily commute. I, I commute by ferry from Larkspur down to San Francisco to my office at Embarcadero Center. And one day, a couple of years ago, I was uh, on the ferry. Uh, and we first thing you see you know, on the Larkspur Ferry is San Quentin. Many of you are nodding. Um, and I was reading our local paper, the Marin Independent Journal. And uh, there was a note in the paper that the oldest man on death row had died of natural causes. Now, that's not unusual. Okay? At the moment, last time I looked, there were 669 men on death row at San Quentin. And we execute, well, at the moment, we aren't executing anybody. But in California, we're executing maybe one or two a year. So generally speaking, the, most of them are going to die in prison. Um, Scott Peterson, I think, was number 658 kind of give you a frame of reference there. So as I was uh, riding on the ferry, I saw this note in the paper about the oldest guy in death row dying, and I thought, well, what would have happened if, um, if his number had come up when he was about to die anyway? Would the state have gone ahead with the execution, or would the state have just held off? So I did what passes for research for me. I didn't go to a bunch of law books, and I didn't uh, uh, spend a lot of time uh, in the library. I called a friend of mine uh, named David Nickerson, who is uh, a wonderful appellate attorney, and David actually represents people on death row. And I said to David, well, what would happen if you got the oldest guy on death row and he's about to die? And I said, would they go ahead with the execution anyway? And he said, oh yeah, they would. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, because it's the law. And you actually find that line in this book when you read it. Um, and so. Uh, David said to me at that point, you know, that would be a pretty good plot line for a book. And I said, yeah, that's kind of what, uh, what I had in mind. So David called a couple of weeks later and he said, um, I'm going out to San Quentin to meet a couple of my uh, death row inmate uh, clients. Would you be interested in joining me? And I thought about that for a few minutes and decided, yeah, I guess if I'm going to write a book about a death penalty case, it probably would be good for me to see what it looks like inside San Quentin. And I must tell you, it was a pretty spooky experience. Um, they don't allow 
the attorneys to go back into the cell blocks, but there is a, a, a visitor's area for the death row inmates, uh, and it's a room that's maybe a third of the size of this seating area here, and there are about a dozen little cells, about six by six, um, where they take the lawyers in and they lock the door, and then a minute later they bring the prisoner in with the handcuffs and the whole nine yards, and they let the prisoner in, then they lock the door again. And you're in there with uh, a convicted murderer. And they tell you if, uh, you know, if there's a problem, we'll come get you. But the reality of it is, if you've got a problem, it's going to take them a while to find the right keys, because San Quentin's a very old prison, and they have you know, big rings of keys, and they got to find, uh, they got to come in and find you. And it was weird. Um, it wasn't real scary for me, but it was a very odd experience. I mean, for example, the last thing they tell you as you're walking through the last metal detector, because there are a couple of them, uh, the guard turns to you as you're walking into the prison grounds and says, now, you understand our uh, hostage negotiation policy, don't you? And I said, and what would that be? And he said, we have none. You're on your own. I said, got it. Um, and there are, San Quentin's a very old and uh, really a kind of an obsolete facility. And so you, all the pictures in your mind of, you know, clanging prison doors and, and guards with the big rolls of keys and stuff, it's exactly the way it is at San Quentin. It's also one of the reasons why um, there's a big uh, discussion going on about uh, building a new uh, death row facility uh, up at San Quentin. And it's a hot issue up in Marin where we live. Uh, and I think most people in, in our neck of the woods would rather see them build a whole new prison somewhere other than, um, somewhere other than San Quentin, but it's not likely to happen. Uh, by the way, San Quentin is the only prison in California where they're allowed to conduct executions uh, by law. So they're not going to be moving the folks out there, uh, out of there anytime soon. Um, maybe what I'll do, uh, if, if you don't mind, to give you a feel of what San Quentin is like, uh, let me read you just the very beginning of uh, Judgment Day. And the, the prisoner that Mike and Rosie are called in to try to represent um, the guy, the accused murderer, the convicted murderer, um, is a mob lawyer. Um, he's a 77-year-old uh, San Francisco flamboyant mob lawyer named Nathan Feynman. And Nate was convicted of murdering three people in the back room of the Golden Dragon restaurant in Chinatown when he got into the middle of a shootout uh, at a meeting of drug dealers. Um, I thought it would be interesting to have a, a, a defendant or a, a, a convicted murderer who was both a lawyer and someone who could more actively participate in their own representation, which is very unusual for death row inmates because most of them have very little to do with what's going on in their own defense outside the walls. So let me give you just a, a, the beginning of Judgment Day, and uh, maybe we can take a few uh, questions or tell a few stories after that. Uh, chapter one is called Welcome to the Row. The oldest man on death row is eyeing me from his wheelchair. Despite his frail appearance, his grip is firm and his baritone is still forceful. Welcome to the row, Mr. Daly, he says to me. We need your help. We're running out of time. More than 650 inmates are awaiting lethal injections on California's death row. Every one of them is running out of time. Thank you for coming in on sh such short notice, he continues. Did you have any trouble getting inside? Nothing out of the ordinary, I tell him. I think to myself, sometimes it seems harder for lawyers to get into San Quentin than it is for our clients to get out. It took me an hour to fill out the stack of forms, sign the multiple releases, and pass through the two metal detectors before I was locked inside one of a dozen windowless six-by-six-foot cells separated by interlaced steel bars covered by scuff plexiglass. The death row visitor's area is just a stone's throw from the little green chamber where the state of California conducts its executions. It's a dark reminder of the burdens borne by the denim-clad prisoners who pass their time going about the mundane business of being incarcerated while their lawyers try to prolong their lives. Mr. Feynman, I say, he cuts me off. It's Nate, he insists. Fine, I think. I'm Mike, and Nate Feynman may be confined to a wheelchair, but I've learned the hard way never to let my guard down. The first client I ever visited on the row was a remorseless psychopath who had stabbed his ex-girlfriend 27 times with an ice pick. Instead of shaking my hand, uh, he introduced himself by slamming me against the wall. His hands were clasped around my throat when the guards finally wrestled him to the floor. 
He never got around to thanking me for getting his death sentence commuted. Every lawyer who handles death penalty appeals has a similar story. I'm flattered that you'd like us to help with your defense, I tell him, but practically speaking, it's really too late for you to replace your lawyer. Nate Feynman strokes his trim gray goatee. Oh, I have no intention of replacing my lawyer, he assures me. That would be crazy. I think to myself, crazy as a fox, maybe. At 77, Nate Feynman has been on the row for 10 years. The bootlegger's son doesn't fit the usual demographics of his neighbors, most of whom are poor, undereducated, and African-American. He's the last of a long line of flamboyant San Francisco legal legends whose ranks included Joseph Aliotto, Melvin Belli, Jake Ehrlich, and Nate Cohn. Known as a street smart hustler with a glib manner and a photographic memory, Nate the Great finished first in his class at Hastings Law School, married the daughter of a superior court judge, then went to work at the public defender's office, where he developed a reputation for courtroom histrionics and self-promotion. He also won a lot of cases. He earned his spot on, San, on the San Francisco Legal Hall of Fame when the DA took a swing at him on the steps of the Hall of Justice after he had manipulated the California rules of evidence to convince an overmatched judge to dismiss a murder charge against a man who shot a police officer four times at point-blank range in front of two witnesses. That incident cost the DA his job and made Nate a household name. An inveterate publicity hound and savvy opportunist, Nate parlayed the notoriety to open his own shop in the graceful Rust Building on Montgomery Street. He used his father-in-law's connections to become the head of the Jewish Community Federation. He became a regular contributor to Herb Cain's legendary gossip column, which ran for years next to the Macy's ad in the middle section of the Chronicle. He was also one of the ringleaders of the fabled Calamari Club, a group of businessmen, politicians, labor leaders, lawyers, and influence peddlers who've been meeting for lunch in the back room of Skomas at the Wharf every Friday afternoon for a half century. By the way, I've been there. Over the years, Nate represented many of San Francisco's most notorious mobsters and drug dealers. He was never apologetic in expressing his view that it was his job to do whatever it took to keep them out of jail. Paradoxically, Nate also garnered numerous community service awards for setting up San Francisco's first legal aid clinic and donating millions to charity. Depending on who was telling the story, he was either a principled crusader who stood up for the underprivileged and the unpopular, or a highly paid mercenary who was as much a part of the drug and underworld culture as the criminals he represented. At times, it seemed he was both. Nate was at the top of his game when he was charged 10 years ago with killing three people in the back room of the Golden Dragon restaurant in Chinatown during a summit conference of drug dealers on a rainy night. Nate was found unconscious in the alley behind the restaurant with a semi-automatic pistol under his arm, and ballistics tests proved that the slugs had been fired from that gun. Nate steadfastly claimed the weapon had been planted. He'd fallen off a fire escape while leaving the building following the shootings and sustained the injury that cost him the use of his legs. The prosecutors argued he was attempting to flee, but Nate insisted he was only trying to dodge the bullets. He hired an all-star lineup of San Francisco's best-known criminal defense attorneys to represent him. His legal team was led by his law school classmate and card-playing buddy, Mort the Sport Goldberg, a theatrical showman who presided over a carnival-like trial that drew as much national media attention as the Lacey Peterson case. Without a witness to corroborate Nate's claim that he was ambushed by a masked assailant, it took the jury less than three hours to convict him of first-degree murder, much to the delight of the San Francisco Police Department. The legal system has played its course, and Judgment Day is fast approaching. I'm going to stop there, but I'm going to assure you that Mike and Rosie will, in fact, take on Nate's representation because if he didn't, the book would end at page five, which would be very embarrassing. I also can fill you in on a couple of other things. For those of you who aren't familiar with my stories or with Mike Daly and Rosie Fernandez, um, Mike's father was uh, now deceased, but he was a San Francisco police officer who happened to be one of the first officers at the scene when this uh, whole event went down. So in order for Mike to try to clear Nate, it may be necessary for Mike to cast some aspersions on his father, who is a very good police officer. So there is a personal angle to this story as well. So I hope you'll be interested enough to, see the, to read the rest of it. Um, I uh, like the way the story lays out, and the critics have been very kind to us so far. Uh, so I hope you will check it out. Um, before we open things up for, for questions in a few minutes, I wanted to tell you about a couple of other things that uh, have happened. Uh, 
One of the nice things about writing books, uh, particularly a series like this where people are always waiting for another one to come out, is you get, uh, you get fan mail. Um, and I joke about the fact that lawyers do not generally get fan mail. Uh, fan mail to lawyers is we get a, a, a call or a note from our client saying thank you for finishing that deal or finishing that case from us. But writers get fan mail from people all over the world. And working in a big place like Google, you understand a big international company, it's nice to hear from people on the other side of the planet. Um, I've heard from people in dozens of countries. My books, by the way, have been translated, I think, now into seven or eight languages. Um, uh, if you'd like to read it in Portuguese or Japanese or Hebrew, I can, I can get you a, a copy. Um, I tend to get a fair amount of mail. I'm sort of, I have mixed emotions about it, but I get a fair amount of mail from soldiers, U.S. soldiers in both Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, which is a, uh, it's a cool thing that they're reading my books, but uh, it would also be nice if they all could come home pretty soon, because I'm sure they would all like to do that. And I've sent boxes of books over there, and uh, we've gotten a lot of nice response from that. Um, I got, a, uh, I got a, an email from a young woman from Yemen not too long ago who wrote, Dear Mr. Siegel, uh, uh, I picked up one of your books in, um, uh, in London, and uh, uh, I really enjoyed it, but we can't get them here in Yemen. Would you be able to send me a copy of a couple of your other books? And, I emailed her back and said I'd be happy to do that, but I also want to be sure that you're not going to get in trouble if I send you the book over there. And she emailed me back and said, no, no, everything's going to be fine. And so uh, I did. I sent her some books over there, and almost immediately she, uh, she sent me a note saying I read them in you know, two days, and I, I really enjoyed them. So uh, it's nice to, get, nice to get word from people. Uh, I got a, a, a letter, it was actually an email, from a, a naval flyer whose job it is to transport people from the mainland, the US mainland, to Guantanamo Bay and back to the base down there. And it turns out that um, my last book, The Confession, was uh, the most, one of the most widely requested books at the Guantanamo Bay Military Base Library. I was very proud of that. Uh, and he put me in touch with the librarian there, and I sent her a whole big box of my books. And she sent me the best picture, and I, w I wish I had brought it with me today, picture of uh, the display table right in the middle of the Guantanamo Bay Military Base Library with a stack of my books with the librarian standing there and smiling. So I hope I brought a little joy to the folks down there, too, because they've, they've got a tough gig, and uh, um, we hope, uh, hope they're doing well down there. Um, I get mail from people frequently. Uh, kind of people who are always asking me, well, when's the next one coming out? Or uh, thanks for putting this one out. I really enjoyed it. My, my all-time favorite, and I, I don't ordinarily read fan mail, but I can't resist. Every time I, I release a book, I get a letter, and it's a handwritten letter with perfect penmanship uh, from a retired legal secretary in Samford, Maine, whose name is Rose Abbott. And I got to read this one to you. Dear Mr. Siegel, congratulations on your new book, I've read all of your books, and I know I will enjoy this one, too. Uh, you may have noticed that my handwriting is a little better now. Uh, I recently had my second rotator cuff replaced, and now my shoulder works a lot better. I have a favor to ask of you. I just turned 93 years old, and I was hoping that I could prevail upon you to try to type a little faster. Best of luck to you for continued success. Thank you very much, and best regards to you, your friend Rose Abbott in Sanford, Maine. And I always look forward to Rose's letters, uh, and this one came in just a couple of weeks ago, and she, uh, she liked the new book, so I was, I was very, very happy about that. So may, maybe uh, on, uh, on that note, uh, having heard from Rose in Afghanistan and other places, um, if you have any questions, uh, if this would be a, a moment if you want to, I guess, step up to the microphone if, if you want to uh, talk about that. Life, writing, lawyering, um, if any of you is writing a novel, we can uh, maybe help you with that too. So, Well, I have, I have a question to start things off. So as a lawyer, your schedule is obviously very busy, and I'm curious for people, maybe people here or listening on YouTube, 
uh, what kind of advice do you have in terms of a writing schedule? So, for instance, for me, I know I do it just like anything else, like during a set time every day. It's just like brushing my teeth, whether it's a good day or a bad day. I'm just going to write a set amount of time. But I'm curious, like, what are your thoughts on that, and, 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 and what's the creative process for you? Well, yeah, the, the greater process, for one, is I'm very lucky now because I don't have to practice law full time anymore. I wrote my first book uh, commuting on a, on a laptop computer, computing, uh, commuting uh, to and from San Francisco on the ferry from Larkspur to San Francisco. And I wrote for 45 minutes going in and 45 minutes coming home. And after our kids went to sleep, I would write for maybe an hour or two at night. And that's why it took me more than three years to write my first book. Um, and uh, after that, uh, because my first contract was for two books and I hadn't actually started the second one when the first one was done, I took some time off and I try to write uh, every day. Uh, the kids go to school and I try to sit in front of the computer and type for you know, four or five hours. Um, a real good day for me is about five pages of double-spaced new material. Um, a spectacular day is 10 pages, but that rarely uh, ever happens. Um, and I, I, I start with a concept of kind of what the story is going to be about. I think a lot about the character arc and where Mike and Rosie are going to be at the beginning of the book and where they're going to be at the end. I have a real good idea of who did it, how, and why, but that, does, that sometimes changes over the course of the book. Um, I do a very, very light outline, you know, a couple of handwritten pages of sort of the hot spots along the way. I think a lot about the characters, you know, who I'm going to need in this type of book. Um, and then I write and write and rewrite. Um, and the process is just absolutely ongoing. Uh, you know, I, I, I never feel like the books are done. Uh, we just finally run out of time and we have to put a cover on it and send it to the readers. But, you know, I probably go through 25 drafts of any, you know, of any given book. And, um, and I edit constantly, which I don't recommend to people who are interested in writing books. If in a perfect world you would just sit down and start writing from beginning to end and not go back and fix anything until you get to the end. But uh, it's not a perfect world. And, I, I can't help myself. I edit a lot as I go along, and uh, it's it's a very organic process. It's kind of hard to describe, and if I could if I could teach it or bottle it, I could probably uh, I could probably sell it, but uh, uh, but I can't. And you know, the other thing too is everybody does it differently. Um, you know, I I know you have a lot of authors in here, and I, this question's probably come up, but. You know, I outline very lightly, uh, and as I'm starting to write, I do outline in a little more detail about 50 pages ahead of where I am uh, at any given time and try to write to that point. Um, and I've talked to authors who do it kind of the same way. Michael Connolly told me that's kind of the way he does it. Uh, he doesn't do a re real detailed outline because he has the same problem I have, which is I get to about page six of the manuscript and I go right off the outline and characters start misbehaving and then I get mad at myself for having an outline that's not going to be something I follow. Uh, other people, uh, Richard North Patterson does 100 pages of single space, very detailed outlining before he'll start writing the book. And then he just fills in the blanks, more or less. He fills in the gaps. And if you've ever read anything by Lisa Scottolini, who's another wonderful lawyer uh, author, uh, she calls her editor, says, this is what the book's going to be about, and starts typing. And she figures it out as she goes. And I can't do that, but uh, um, I can understand how, you know, if that works for you, uh, works, you know. There, there, there are no rules about any of this. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Oh, definitely. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, well, given that life often imitates fiction and you see stranger things in, in the newspaper than in books, um, how do you avoid uh, writing things that sound like cliches? For example, if you have a, a bad guy with a nickname, I think I saw one, uh, you know, it almost seems like a, like if, if, you're, if you're talking about a pirate and you, said, and you say, oh, he's wearing an eye patch, you think, oh, that, that sounds so stupid, so cliche. But, you know, maybe real pirates do have eye patches, so how do you, how do you deal with that? You know, it, it's actually a really good question because um, 
you know, particularly with, if you're doing crime fiction, you know, th these are at their heart mystery or suspense novels. And you do, it, it helps a lot if you can identify the good guys and the bad guys. But you're right, the books get very uninteresting if the good guys are all too good and the bad guys are all completely evil. Um, and my rule of thumb is the, the people who are central to the story have to be a little of both. Uh, the good guys have to be more good than bad, but they have to be flawed. And the bad guys, um, at least the ones you can identify as bad guys, uh, they have to have some redeeming qualities, something you can kind of hang a hook on. Uh, because otherwise, I think, you, um, I think you do get into cartoon characters at that point. Uh, and if you have wooden characters, it, particularly in um, the type of fiction I'm writing, which is character-driven stuff, you know, you can get away with that more if you're trying to make, uh, you know, if you're trying to, to, to write a plot-driven thriller that's all about, you know, the, the roller coaster ride. Um, and my, my kind of view of it is um, the smaller the role the character has, the more uh, of a caricature they can become. But the longer they're on stage, the more three-dimensional they have to be and the more complex they have to be because otherwise you ruin the the whole effect, and uh, I wish I could give you a more specific guideline on that, but uh, you do a lot of it kind of by uh, kind of by feel on that. Hi, um, thanks. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading this book. I was wondering if the right sequence is to go back and read your earlier Mike Daly novels first, or. Well, I, I was going to say, is it necessary to read the earlier ones first? No. Um, I would say this, I mean, if you like series, which I do, I mean, yeah. what happens to me usually is I'll, I'll pick up a, you know, the new book by somebody and then I'll go back and read all the old stuff. And uh, I mean, you can read them out of order, but if you, if you like series, it, uh, it is kind of fun to start at the beginning. And uh, I mean, my characters do age, they do evolve, things change in their lives, you know, from book to book. And I think that's... Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of a matter of uh, it's kind of a matter of taste. Uh, in so better to start at the beginning. So, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. So thanks for coming. Um, you mentioned that all your books are set in San Francisco and that you've lived and worked in San Francisco. I was wondering. Um, how do you sort of research and ensure that your novels have a sense of place uh, and that the setting becomes a character in itself? Oh, how do you uh, develop a sense of place? Well, I made a conscious decision with my very first book that I was going to write about contemporary San Francisco so that I wouldn't have to go anywhere else to do research or spend a lot of time uh, uh, hitting the books to do like historical fiction. I have great admiration for people who, you know, who can write historical fiction or write about other places convincingly. Um, and it was, I, I was working full time uh, when um, you know, I wrote that, started writing the first book. So it was a matter of expedience for me. In addition, I, I think you know, contemporary San Francisco is a great setting for crime fiction. Uh, people in other parts of the country have been here. They like to read about it. Um, but there's also a difference, too. I mean, I, I really do try to make San Francisco a character in the stories. I, I'm always trying to put my... Mike and Rosie in places where the natives would go, but the tourists wouldn't. So you can take people who have been to San Francisco to the spots where the natives would go. Uh, for example, the, the most mail I've ever gotten about um, a location in my books was my very first book. I did a scene at Bill's Place, which is a hamburger place at 23rd and Clement. If you haven't been there, you ought to go because it's been there for you know since about 1960, and it hasn't changed a bit. It looks like it came right out of a time capsule. Um, there are scenes in this book, in, um, uh, there's a scene at Original Joe's, there's a scene at uh, 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 Cafe Sport. Uh, you can tell I like to eat a lot, so we go, to, we go to a lot of different restaurants. But to the extent that you can bring that ambiance in uh, and give the readers a feel for, for that, it's, it, it is important, I think. Um, but it also kind of depends on what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, I also think that you you need to be able to to describe the essence of any given spot in just a couple of paragraphs. You know, I give myself 
one or two paragraphs to get you into the Hall of Justice, to give you a feel for it, and then to move the story on. Uh, it's not a hard and fast rule, but that's kind of the way I think of it, that you, you gotta just keep the pages uh, turning. One thing I had to learn when going from being a lawyer writer to a, to a fiction writer is that readers fill in a lot of the blanks when they're write, reading novels, and so you don't have to give them more than uh, a little bit of, uh, of a feel for it. San Francisco, by the way, is also, it's a great place, you know, going back to the days of Dashiell Hammond, it's a great place to write mystery. Uh, a lot of people say it's the great noir city other than maybe LA. Um, and these books are not that dark, you know, they're, uh, I, I'm not trying to do that, but, you know, between the rain and the fog and the geography and uh, the fact that it's a very compact city, uh, it's a real, real good spot to, uh, to, set, to set crime fiction. Hi, I have questions about, um, I think things are changing all the time. I mean, in our area of work, um, I'm, I'm working on the ads area. I mean, I'm constantly hearing changes in television, changes in uh, radio, printed media, magazine, newspaper, and so on. Do you see books, how would books evolve in going forward? And if, let's say, when you write your 15th book, and how would it be different from the first one? You know, that's actually a real good question because, you know, a lot of people are wondering, you know, I think they asked the... Um, you know, the head of the New York Times, whether they would still have a print edition in five years, and he said he wasn't sure. Uh, and uh, I don't know what my 15th book will look like. Um, you know, if I've been, my first book came out in 2000, and, you know, print on demand and electronic delivery systems, they have been tried, but they haven't really caught on yet. But I have to think they're going to at some point. Um, and you know what, what has changed uh, in the publishing business a lot is the availability of um, you know print on demand and electronic delivery, and everybody's trying to wrestle with that because the publishing world is still, in many respects, locked in a time warp from you know 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, I think there will always, at least I hope there will still be room for books because people do seem to like the feel of. Um, you know, of having a book to read, and you know, when you finish it, you put it on the bookcase like a trophy, even if you never open it again. Um, but I could see, uh, you know, the the uh, Kindle format on Amazon seems to be catching on, um, and you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a fair amount of a, a whole lot more uh, in electronic format, you know, in five years, and certainly in you know, ten or fifteen years. I, I think there's going to be a lot more of that kind of delivery. Uh, I just hope we still have books with covers and but I mean you think about you know you think about the way music is delivered now remember you know when I was a kid you know album covers and art and that kind of stuff was a big deal and now to some degree that's very much a you know a lost art of a different medium so um, be interesting to see how it all shakes out we I guess that's probably it, but uh, thank you, Sheldon, so much for coming, and um, if we have time afterwards, we'll do some book signings in case anyone's interested. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much.